Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I've got uh, uh, quite a few slides, so I'm just going to uh, start uh, diving right in. I realize there's still some people uh, uh, filtering in. So uh, thank you for sticking around to uh, almost the very, very end. So uh, uh, two, two full days. Hopefully you still have space left to, to cram a little bit more in. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about the Dark Forest, a distributed file system for secure peer-to-peer -peer applications. My name is Brooklyn Zelenka. You can find me on the internet as Xpeed. I'm the co-founder and CTO of a company called Fission, where we're working on infrastructure and SDKs for Edge, Far Edge, and local first apps. Um, I also do a bunch of standards work uh, that includes uh, things that have come out of this file system uh, as well. So not everything on there, but actually uh, quite a lot of it as we found that we need to solve things for, uh, uh, for example, uh, offline auth and, and other, other things. So we're going to be talking about the Web Native File System, or WinFS. Uh, hot off the presses, this is uh, Winnie, our, our new mascot. And uh, we've been working on this for a little under three years. Um, and for the first while of that, maybe half of that, uh, we were told it couldn't be done uh, repeatedly, even when we had a demo. Uh, and we'd have to actually show people, like, you know, open the console and show them exactly what was happening. They'd go, oh, actually, I, I, I guess this could possibly happen. And the reason for that is that the trade-offs when you're working local first are completely flipped around from when you have a centralized server, right? Doing things like uh, having uh, self-sovereign data and uh, portable data between applications and working offline are all trivial. Trying to get the Twitter fire hose is extremely difficult, and we're, we're still working on that, um, but the, it's completely backwards from how you'd normally think about an application. So we've had to invent a lot of things along the way because local first software is pretty new, right? Which means that there's lots of low-hanging fruit, which is great, but you really have to work from first principles. There's lots of sharp corners, and you have to find ways out of different uh, interesting problems. Um, because this is so uh, underexplored, and we found that a lot of the techniques that we've developed are quite general, uh, we're now extending this work to local first databases, blind buses, NIM servers, and a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, and really, this is a novel recombination of a bunch of existing ideas, plus a few things that we've had to um, uh, figure out along the way. So that you don't have to reinvent the universe too, please steal all of this tech, whatever you find useful. And today we're gonna to be talking about uh, roughly a third on the public file system and two thirds on the secret or the encrypted file system because you'll need to understand the public stuff to get the private stuff. So first of all, why do we even care about having things that run completely locally or flexibly across the, the network? Well, the internet was really invented in, we'll call it the early 90s when software was considered to be very convenient. You could create software for accounting and just own the entire market suddenly because you have access to so many more people and you're much more efficient. Today, it's absolutely critical. Everybody is a software company, all of them. It used to be that the only hardware powerful enough to run this stuff sat in a data center, so we were always going across the network. Now we have very powerful clients, right? The uh, chip in my iPhone is unbelievably powerful, and IoT is low powered, but still way more powered than the desktop PC that you know, I had in the early 90s. Access used to be rooted to a single place, and now we carry it around on it, uh, with us. We have it strapped to our wrists. It's everywhere. And we used to be limited by bandwidth, and now we're limited by latency, because the speed of light is finite, it turns out. And the market used to be primarily the US and Europe, and now it is global, and we're starting to put things in space. We've discovered over the last 30 or so years that storing information in the clear in your database is often a bad idea. Keeping credit card information in 2005 in a database to have a hacker break in and steal everybody's credit card information was standard practice. We've since realized that that was a bad idea and we don't do that anymore. And we're starting to realize as a society that doing the same thing with personal information is a bad idea. And that's getting regulated out. We've been trying to write the same style of application since the late 90s. We'll call it 25, 30 years, the LAMP stack. And even things like 
Docker, and Kubernetes are trying to extend this metaphor and extend this architecture as far as it can possibly go. So taking a step back and thinking from first principles, why do we have such a distance between developers and users where we have to train, hire for, and keep up to date and maintain software for front end, back end, database, DevOps, it's a towering stack of things, right? Why is it so big? We think that if we look at and apply some newer data structures and some new computer science and these newer, more powerful clients, we can rearrange how data is stored so that users can own their data, they can have one or more stores, and then load data into applications as needed. And this sounds bizarre and completely flipped around until you realize that this is exactly how native platforms work, right? It asks you, can I have access to your camera roll? Not, can, you know, I'm gonna store new photos into this specific app. It says, can I access your, you know, downloads, et cetera, right? Why doesn't the web work like that too? So when we've worked with um, other partners and other companies uh, at applying this kind of an architecture, we found that people need four things. And this list may look strange at first glance. We need local first access control, arbitrary metadata, mutability, and versioning so that we can have concurrency. And usually people take issue with at least one thing on this list and say, well, I actually don't need whatever the thing is. And we sit down with them and we talk through, okay, well, you know, how would that work? And at about five or 10 minutes in, they go, oh, that's why I would need versioning. Or, oh, that's why I would want metadata. So in general, we find that these four are the really four main properties for such a system. The other thing that we've learned on a more of a practical level is uh, we had done the original version in TypeScript because we were targeting the web, but writing things in Wasmable Rust is a pretty great idea. It is not the glorious write once, run everywhere future, right? It's pretty close to it though. And so we're currently undergoing a, a complete rewrite and upgrade of the system into WebAssembly and then also so that we can target uh, native apps as well. Ideally, a file system and all the cool stuff we're gonna talk about today is completely invisible, right? That, that's when you've won. So just to give you a sense of the kind of use cases then that you can build on top of this, uh, you should be able to do web apps. So this is an example that we've built that's essentially like a Dropbox clone. Uh, you should do, be able to do tools for thought. So there's a tiddlywiki plugin for, for WinFS. Uh, data science, there was a startup that sadly has since gone under uh, that was building a data science platform with WinFS. And we're currently working on integrating with some storage networks uh, as well to provide encryption out of the box. The API is kind of what you'd expect, right? LS, Maker, RM, MV, all of these. This is the, uh, uh, some example code for uh, the JavaScript API. And it also has some extra stuff that uh, isn't in sort of your standard Unix uh, uh, API, which is history and versioning and uh, merge semantics. We've built this all because we looked at content addressing and realized that it was really, really important. So I'm gonna give you a little primer on that so that the rest of this makes sense. Nancy Lynch uh, has this great quote that in distributed systems, the fundamental thing that we're contending with is local knowledge. Because again, the speed of light is finite, the speed of information is finite. Even if we've made two requests, we don't know what is on the other side, right? So we need to find some uh, general abstractions and general things that we can all agree on so that we can become uh, uh, interoperable and reduce the possible number of states. The addressing stack today looks a little bit like this. You have DNS, so you go to example.com, that refers you to some IP address, and then you ask for a path at that. And if I do two requests, I go to that specific machine, and I say, whatever you're gonna give me back for this, I'll take. So we do that twice, maybe we get the same thing, maybe we get something different. It's a little bit like going into uh, a library being told, okay, it is at the central library on the third floor, this many shelves in, this far into the stack, and the, you know, the fourth book from the right, and whatever's there you take. Content addressing says, what if we addressed everything by its hash? So we'll take its content and hash it, so uh, SHA-256, for example, exactly the sort of thing that you would do with, uh, where you get a, a commit hash from Git, and if you hash the data or I hash the data, it's deterministic, we'll get back the same number. 
So this is more like saying, hey, where in the library system can I get a copy of War and Peace? And then you'll say, oh, you can go to any of these branches and just ask the librarian, and they'll get it for you. You don't have to build such a system on top of, the, uh, on top of IPFS. We've built this uh, as the first block store for us. Um, you could technically do any, but uh, I'm gonna walk you through uh, interplanetary linked data, which is their, uh, uh, their format. It has two parts in it, it has bytes and links, so you know, literally some, some chunk of a file and then links to other files. We take those two together, we hash them, and we get its unique hash. And then those links point out to other things that look exactly like this. So it's just a graph. Mutability, because hashes, if we change even a single bit, that top hash changes. So we still want this to be mutable. And as long as you have some mutable pointer, so it could be a database or a blockchain, doesn't really matter, we use DNS as a distributed key value store, DNS text records. Uh, and we can point then at this particular hash for this data structure. And then maybe there's another one, maybe it's an update or a totally different structure and we can change that pointer over there. And this is really great because the two levels are decoupled. I can build data structures and then move this pointer around, right? It's all the nice functional stuff that we get, but at web scale, right? Um, and this means that all of our writes are atomic. You can build software transactional memory on top of this. In fact, we've done that. Uh, you can do reductions, you can do rollbacks, all of these things. And you can even point to previous versions. If you want to keep the information that this was based on something else, you can just write that into the data structure. These hard links, these content addresses, work just like hard links on Unix. You're saying that specific file, this thing over here, nothing else, right? And that's new for the web. We haven't had that before. We've only had URLs, which are a little bit like symlinks or soft links which says, relative to some other structure, give me this path inside of it, right? So we've gotten pretty far uh, with some links. Um, hard links are new. We also want content addressing because it lets us do really easy, clean, selective replication and data partitioning. So if I have a phone with very low power relative to some giant server, I can say, well, I'm only really interested in these blocks can you send those to me? And I can operate on them and create a diff and then synchronize just that diff, right? So this is all you, you know, your classic persistent data structure stuff, plus with the ability to have this consistent naming scheme across all the systems in the world. The layout for the file system is that we have a root, and this is the, the part that gets that mutable pointer aimed at it. We have some of the information about the owner, and it's just a public key, so it's pseudonymous. Right? They don't need to know that it's this human being, just that you can sign. There's a public portion, which is, as you can imagine, public information, so you can host a website in there, have you know, photo gallery, that kind of thing. And then encrypted data. Inside that encrypted structure, we also have a uh, sharing inbox and outbox, which we will not be covering today. If I had an extra 20 minutes, we could get into that stuff too. If you're curious about that, we can talk about it after. Semantic layers, you're probably familiar with a stack that looks a little bit like this, where at the low level we have data, just blocks of data, and above that we create something that's a little bit semant more semantically rich, files. How this interacts with encryption, we've looked at it a couple different ways, and really, you have another dimension, which is visibility, right? So they sit next to each other. And when we take you know, a cut across this, from the bottom, encrypted data is just a some kind of a set of random bits. In our case, it's a Merkle set. Um, for encrypted files, you know in some encrypted data structure, you have headers and node layout, but you don't know what's in there. You know that this is a header and that this is either a file or a directory you don't actually know, and you don't know how they're related to each other. And finally, decrypted files or visible files are either public content or something that you've managed to decrypt out of some encrypted store. And that's both the paths and the content. We're gonna look at both encrypted paths and encrypted data later. Public files. So of course we have these simple nodes. We build out of several of them a uh, header. This is controlled anytime you see kernel, this is controlled by the SDK. 
you have some raw data that the user puts in there, so maybe this is a photo or a movie, and arbitrary metadata that the user writes in. So that could be things like the mime type, the creator, tags, last time it was updated, any of that stuff. And then we have directories. It looks pretty much the same, except instead of uh, raw data, we have an index. And that index points to either more directories or files, because it's a file system. We build these from the bottom up. So here's a photo of uh, beach.png. It has its own hash. We then point down to that from a directory. It has its own hash as well. This one's called vacation. I have a caricature which lives in avatars, and then we can put all of those in photos. And again, the top photos has a hash that if anything underneath it, so if caricature was one bit different, that top hash would be different. This is one snapshot, one version of this directory, revision zero. We don't use the term version because that gets really confusing when we start talking about versions of the file system versus versions of the data, so revision zero. And over time, you're going to want to make changes to this. So here's revision one. I'm going to add a photo called smiling.ping. That lives in a new version of avatars because the content underneath it has changed. And I'm going to link back to the file that has not been changed at all and not been um, updated or deleted, uh, caricature.jpg. That then lives inside of a new version of photos. But these green blocks now are shared between the two structures. So if I want to ask, what's the data in revision one, it's all of these blocks that have not been uh, faded out. But the whole structure looks like this. There's no common root between these two at the moment because they're separate versions. They share some under, underlying data, but I can't point to a single root. So we point back at the old versions of everything. So this both preserves the history, we can always roll back, and uh, it roots everything together. We'll look at that on the next slide. And we get the events that caused these changes. So this top one has child event because below it, we inserted a new file, which is this smiling. And if I reorient this diagram, so all the links are still pointing to the right things, you can see now that the top of this is that photos at revision one. We point at uh, the original one previously, and when I want to do this atomic update, I just change this top pointer. The actual data is pretty straightforward. It's actually in CBOR, but I'm gonna do it in, in JSON just because it's easier to follow. This is the section that's managed by the SDK. It has a field that can either be file or directory. It has some history. Now, the history is a, a, a list or an array. That's not the whole history behind it. It can have multiple histories in the same way that you've now, uh, uh, if you've forked in Git and then done a merge, right? It can have multiple past histories. And we'll talk a fair bit about that later. Here's the metadata field and uh, some content. And there's a couple more fields, but it's actually, this is sort of 95% of it. So history. Here is a file and an update to that file and then an update to that. So this is its nice linear history. But because this is uh, all local first and can be uh, updated offline and merged together later, that means that somebody may have only seen A or B and not C, so maybe their history looks something like this, where X was aware of W, which was aware of A, and X was also aware of B, but not C. So when I take two file systems and I go to merge them together, I look at the heads of these two files and realize, ah, these are not the same. And in fact, the, the roots of the two would be different as well, right? Because any change below will change uh, the hash of the, the top. But for a single file, I say, okay, these are different. So I need to reconcile those two somehow. And there's a bunch of different mechanisms for this. The absolute simplest is we just take the lowest hash, right? Just, you know, does this one ends in a one and this one ends in a zero? Great, we'll go with zero. You can, uh, there's a whole spectrum in there. Uh, all the way up to letting uh, developers plug in and define a merge for their specific data type, right? So it's like based on, uh, you know, it's a Photoshop document and this one has more layers or we'll merge the layers together or something like that. This is the same diagram, just uh, cleaned up a little bit. So every time I change a file, I also have to change the directory above it. 
So these are the directories, the parents for each of those and the pointers down into the file. And uh, you can see that they share the same structure, right? But a directory might have more children that have changed in the middle, or it has had its own metadata change. So it has more revisions always, uh, the same number or more than a particular child. And now we have these extra ones, right? So without and then with these extra changes, they need to now also incorporate the previous version of the file that they had seen previously to get that nice structural sharing we were talking about. So uh, as my team likes to often say, uh, hash-linked revisions form a joint semi-lattice over causal relations. What's the problem? Uh, diff checkpointing. So we want to have some quick way of figuring out where this diff happened so we can show the user, hey, from the last time you looked at this thing, here's what's changed, right? And actually there's, there's a few use cases for this uh, in, in the SDK itself as well. So here's a file, it goes along, and then it splits into two separate histories, right? So this is, again, just one file over time with a branch in it, and where that orange node knew about this dark blue uh, as well. I can't say, go back two, and we'll you know, skip by two, or skip by 10, or skip by 100, because the different histories might have different number of nodes in them. So we have to find some common way of saying, the last one of, of what? Right? So we can uh, have a tunable hardness parameter that's like nodes whose hash ends in two zeros. And you can even do this on multiple levels. So you have you know, quicker skips that are two and longer skips that are you know, 10 zeros or something. And we take uh, all of these, have then a pointer back to their most recent ancestor, as well as the last one that had two zeros in it. And then those will also point back further. So we now have this much faster highway, basically, between them. And uh, the same on the other branch, but it has some zeros sooner as well. So we start walking back on both sides, on the top and bottom, and we discover, aha, uh, this green node is the common one between the two. So I know that the last time that we were in sync was at least, or as oldest, at this point. It's probably newer than that. Maybe, maybe not, right? And then we can do things like a split search and find that, okay, it's on this, this side, and then we can find the exact last common node, for example. So that was all public data um, and talking about links between files in a persistent file system. Let's talk about secret files, uh, which is under the assumption that, as we like to say, all the pipes are broken. So we assume uh, you've stored some data and somebody's gonna be able to get into your server, right? So it needs to be encrypted at rest. It needs to be encrypted as often as possible. One of my all-time favorite quotes is, uh, cryptography is a tool for turning lots of different problems into key management problems. <laughs> and when I first read this, I was horrified because key management is really hard. But from a system design perspective, this is really liberating because key management is pretty abstract, right? This could be a hardware security module. If it's not really that important data, maybe it's a passphrase. Uh, somebody could use an Ethereum wallet, right? Like we have all of these options all of a sudden. We call this uh, data structure a dark forest because it is uh, a hidden sequence of trees. We use a data structure called a champ which is a kind of optimized hash rate map try, um, which really just means that it's a set, in, in our case, uh, of encrypted blocks at the bottom. We've given it a branching factor of 16, so every node has up to 16 children. And we found that this is a really nice balance between doing efficient diffs with merkleization and keeping the tree relatively shallow. Right, so a B tree in a database will often be you know, uh, 1024 or, or bigger sometimes. Um, because we're doing this uh, uh, over the network, we need some of these, these other properties. So with um, three levels, we get about uh, 4,000 um, buckets, and at five levels, there's about a million. And then it's also sharded per user. So it ends up actually working out pretty well in practice. It is an append-only version of this structure. It is reasonably quick to read and write, and especially if we have it locally, we don't have to go over the network and incur uh, latency cost. It's Merkleized, so we know if two of them are identical, we just have to look at the top hash, and it's concurrency friendly. 
it is a pointer machine. So unlike the public system where everything is laid out directly in links, this we have, yes, they're encrypted. And so uh, we need to point at different things uh, by their name rather than by their hash, even though technically the encrypted blocks are kept in this structure by their hash. This means that we can keep as many data structures in here as we want. We can keep a file system and a database and indices and sharing stuff all in this one thing. All of the leaves look the same from the outside. They're just random bits, which means that we can make merging really efficient on this. We don't have to worry. As long as it, is, as long as it respects set semantics, right, we can just union them together. We get deduplication on common blocks, and uh, we can literally just mash them together. So in this case, we've had to split one of those nodes into two to keep it of the, you know, the appropriate size. And going back to this diagram from before, this is the encrypted data layer, so it is a Merkle set. Now, we're using this champ, Mer Merkle champ. Uh, you could use anything. You could use a proly tree or a B plus tree. It doesn't really matter, as long as the keys are sorted. We also use multi-values for conflicts. So if I zoom in on just this one uh, leaf, it has inside of it a header that you know is a header. You, don't, you can't read inside of it if you're like, okay, this is a header block. And a bunch of different versions of that content. This is from if we've branched four times and written to the same revision number for the same file, uh, we then have to store this four times, right? And these could have also been created completely separately without awareness of each other and then merged together. And we also keep some witnesses. We'll talk about witnesses right at the end. So the actual encrypted data, we have an encrypted node. It, it's indistinguishable from the rest. It's just random bits. And with an AES key, it doesn't have to be AES, but we use 256-bit AES keys, we can decrypt what looks a whole lot like a public file out of it, including the header, everything else. Um, it has a couple extra fields in it, uh, which you'll see some of later, but fundamentally, the, from the user perspective, it has the same information inside of it. Now, of course, files we want to keep inside of directories. So the directory is also encrypted with a completely separate key that is in no way related to it. Okay. Often people look at a setup like this and they say, well, wouldn't it be really great if I could drive the lower key from the higher key. But the problem is if I ever want to rotate that key and remove somebody's access to a file, they can't be in that direct relationship, right? So they're completely separate, randomly generated uh, keys. Now, we don't want people to be able to correlate these two, even though once we've decrypted them, we can see that there's these two levels that interact together. So every version, every block now, or every block, uh, every file in this tree has its own key. That's a lot of keys, right? So uh, lots of blocks, lots of keys. But you only need one to get into the file system and start reading things. So here's that uh, dark forest again. We unlock this one block or this one file. It could be anywhere in this structure. We're just going to for space, put it on the left. And when we open that up, we see, ah, this is a directory and it has a link to this one and the key for that one. And I can jump over there and over here and we can rediscover and unshuffle the rest of the structure. This is something called a crypt tree. It's been around since about 2008, I remember, if I remember correctly. We've, we've made a couple uh, modifications to it here. But the basic idea is this. Uh, we have a bunch of encrypted nodes and I decrypt one of them. And inside of this directory, it has pointers to two files and the keys on that pointer. So with this one top key, I can now know, okay, I need to go to this far side and you know, that other far side, and I can decrypt them. So as we walk down the tree, we start to rediscover its structure as we walk down. This works totally offline without having to ask a server for, hey, you know, here's something that proves that I'm allowed to read this thing. Here's the, the two data structures next to each other. Actually, let me go back one. The, uh, the encrypted version and the unencrypted version next to each other, right? Same number of nodes. They're just how, how they're actually laid out, right, and, and persisted. 
If I give you a key for photos, you can read everything under photos, but not docs and not the root. And I also have to tell you which node to start from. But I could also give you just a key for this one photo or for this one subdirectory, and you wouldn't be able to see the things above or next to them. So as we walk down this tree, I can, on the link, know it's this one, okay, I can get into there. I know it's this block, okay, I can get into that one. Great, right? There's one extra bit, though, because we also have this concept of time. Time is different from this hierarchy because we don't know what the next version is going to be when we wrote it. So the way we handle this is we use uh, hashing, something called a ratchet. So we take the key for that and we hash the key and that is now the key for the new version. If I give you at a certain point in time, you can read all the versions from that point onwards, but not previously. For those of you who came to the skip ratchet talk yesterday, this is where we use the skip ratchet because if there's been a million updates since the last time you looked at it, we want an efficient way to jump to the end without having to do a million steps. So we call this a temporal crypt tree. And it's laid out like this. Here is the root temporal header and that points down into some docs. And then I have another version of this that also has uh, strange loop.md in it. So of course, these are different structures, so these are different revisions. And using that hashing I was just talking about, I can now jump across in time forwards using that ratchet. And we can do that again for the next version as well, and that's the next revision. But what if I wanna give you not just one range in time, property of a skip ratchet, or all from a point in time onwards, which is just any ratchet, but if I wanna give you just a single version, well, we can derive a key for just the content for this one version uh, from the header key. And then we can do the same thing for docs and put a link between those two. And so now, this is one snapshot of this directory, and it has no pointers to the right. I can't get further in time. We can do the same thing for each of these revisions. Not only can we, we, we do this for each of these revisions. And uh, I'll just clean up the, the slide a little bit. If I give you access to this version, you know, version two, I guess, of the docs, you can access all of these and nothing else because you can follow this, this, and this path, and none of the others. So that's read access. How do you actually go and write one of these? I might want to give you write access to only my photos and nothing else. Well, here's my, uh, the actual decrypted underlying structure. But remember, it's still in this encrypted, totally flat structure. And you have write access to this section down here, which we'll call revision zero. I then write an update to just as much of it as I can. So I've added a file under this one directory. Okay, but it's not rooted. It doesn't go all the way back up to the top because I don't even know what the top of the structure is named because I only have access down here. We call this lazy rooting or attachment progress. I can then keep making updates to this one subdirectory and when somebody comes along that has write access further up in the stack, they then attach it and do all of the structural sharing stuff that we were showing before and all of the backlinks for time, as I showed before. Okay. So over time, we're lazily building up all the way to the root. If you have root access, you can walk down, and this, the orange blocks don't exist yet, so let's say that we're back here. Right, orange blocks aren't there. I can walk down to that one, and then use the ratchets to go forward in time. So I can always get there, but it's more steps than uh, if I have one of these. Right? So it's this collaborative process. I've mentioned a few times that we've encrypted the names and the paths in the file system. Correlation is bad. If I can look at the file system and say, these look like your legal documents or these look like your family photos, maybe I'm gonna start trying to break those first. So we need the whole thing to be completely opaque, right? Again, the term is indistinguishable. We need this both against the file hierarchy, so in space and in time. 
Today we use something called a Nyberg accumulator, which is based on bloom filters. Um, it has a couple weaknesses. It's really fast, but it has a couple weaknesses. So we're moving to something called a, uh, based on a property called quasi-commutativity and with a quasi-commutative hash uh, using uh, RSA accumulators. This property looks something like this. You have uh, X and Y, one, and you hash those together with a special kind of hash, and Y, two, and then you hash that hash together. Or if you have Y, one and Y, two inverted, we will get the same hash at the end. Given that, x stays first. So we need some secret in that x position. Everything after that can be totally swapped around, hence quasi-commutative instead of commutative. This lets us build a cryptographic accumulator. Here are all the file segments, the path segments, to get down into the stage.png. And my key for this version of that. So each file has a unique ID across versions, and then we use the key uh, as the, like, the version number for that file. I'll just move these around a little bit. I, don't, I should not know the path that I'm underneath. I just know that this is a file called stage.png, and that's it. So what we give them and what we pass down is not each of these. We start the accumulation early, and we give them the accumulator, which is completely opaque to them. It just looks like random bits. The stage.png uh, at 42 key, which they needed to decrypt it, and uh, the I number for this node. We put the version into that accumulator, and this is the first half of our witness, the proof that, this, um, that I'm allowed to write into this. And the stage.png is the other half. And now I've created, by uh, hashing these together, created this special path that other people can then look up that special, like, I expect 42 to be at this point. And I can prove in a certificate that uh, this name includes the thing that I'm allowed to write to and no other information. So it's a kind of zero knowledge uh, accumulator. Now, if somebody has given me access and they have access to photos, and stage.png is a subfile of that, I have to move photos into the area of things that I know about. And we do something that looks pretty similar, right? We have our parent accumulator, and I know about the rest of these. We stick those together. We stick the two components here that I need to prove that I have access together. And I can generate the path. And to somebody verifying this, I have to show them that, yep, photos is in there, stage.png is in there with this witness two of two, and there's some other stuff. And because it's hard, impractical, really, to reverse a hash, I wouldn't have been able to construct this path otherwise. So, to wrap up, I've shown you hash-linked files, privacy-preserving paths, crypt trees, temporal access control, file history, and fork merge on both public and private data. We have some future work on this. Uh, I was really hoping that the WASM rewrite would be done by today. Uh, it, we're really close. It's probably just a couple weeks more. Um, but we are producing uh, WebAssembly and native SDKs based on our Rust implementation. We're taking a lot of the things we learned building this and applying it to a local first encrypted at rest collaborative data log, where we're also expressing CRDTs as data log. We need faster, more reliable networking. Uh, IPFS is great about 60% of the time, and so we're dropping down a layer and uh, helping fix parts of that. Uh, we want to make uh, the private certificate, uh, the, the certificates about the tree when you're doing writes, uh, more privacy preserving with zero knowledge proofs, and something people have asked for from day one is for a fuse support. Uh, where to get started if you're curious about this stuff, um, guide.fish.codes for the high level API, if you want to read the spec, so we're moving from an informal spec, like an internal spec, that's also posted publicly, but to something that's more formal because there's a bunch of uh, other collaborators that want to work on this together. Um, WinFS-WG, so the Web Native File System Working Group slash spec, and the Rust implementation is the same, but RS-WinFS. Um, we were told at the beginning uh, that it was uh, impossible to do, and yeah, in fact, it took us a little under three years, uh, so it just took a little bit longer. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I guess there's two part answer to that. Uh, one is currently we don't. Uh, we leave all the history in there because uh, storage is getting uh, really, really cheap. 
and we don't have to keep everything on a single system. If you wanted to do that and you wanted to go back through, uh, through the history and compact things, uh, there are algorithms for it. Uh, it's relatively expensive because of the hash linking on the public side. On the private side, it's actually extremely cheap. We can just drop nodes and we, uh, you then have to do a little bit more read time um, uh, work to jump ahead more when you're going forward in time. Yeah, uh, can you remove permissions? Yes. Uh, so you do, for read access, you do a key rotation on that file um, and essentially tombstone it, right? And then point, uh, reshare the key to the people that need it and you write a new version of the parent that has the new key. Um, the, the trade-off here, or the, the, the way of thinking about this, is if somebody goes onto the web, goes onto Facebook and downloads a photo of you, you can't get that back either. So what we're really saying is from this point onwards you can't read, you're kicked out of the group, essentially. Then for write access, uh, I didn't have time to talk about it in here at all. We use a certificate format called UCAN, User Controlled Authorization Networks, where anybody who's delegated to you can revoke your access at any time, and that is gossiped through the network. Yeah, uh, uh, are we worried about quantum uh, cryptography, basically? Um, so yeah, it, it's a problem. If we write this data, especially if we put it, if somebody writes it somewhere that's like very long lived, right? Like they write some of this data or a key to a blockchain, right? And it's gonna be around forever. Um, other than the fact that writing this much data to a blockchain would be extremely expensive, but let's call it like Filecoin or something where it's gonna be around for 30 years. Uh, or somebody's downloaded a file and they wanna get into it at some point. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a problem. Uh, all cryptography is breakable. All of it, right? Um, the question is under what assumptions, right? Um, so uh, we're waiting for the NIST recommendations on post-quantum cryptography, which is in 2024, I believe. Um, and we'll start going from there. We've looked at it, but uh, there was a, a talk, for example, at the Papers We Love conference uh, two days ago that was like one of the major contenders was just broken, right? So we, we're waiting to see what the community recommendation is on that. Ah, uh, so we're, we're uh, looking at um, uh, two main things, right? Right now we find some time, sorry, let me repeat the question. What part of IPFS are we uh, uh, working on improving? So again, IPFS is really great when it works, right? It's just not, not always. Um, and they're doing really, really great work over there, right? So I don't like, want to disparage them at all. They're super smart people. Um, Right now, bit swap, which is the transport, has to go back and forth for every layer on the block, and these are pretty deep. So we've, uh, we're working on a proposal to uh, do batching and matching on, um, uh, on the request that is based on uh, Bloom filters, so that we can then carve out sections and say, just give me all of those, and here's the bits that I already have, match these against it, and maybe I won't, maybe I'll get some duplication, but like, not too much. Um, that's one, and then the other problem that we have sometimes is uh, keeping peers connected, sometimes they drop, and so we have some thoughts on that as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, the diagrams are very pretty. Uh, what tool do I use? I, I use Keynote, which comes with macOS. Yeah. Right, uh, for, for revocations, you mean, yeah. Uh, so we're just using a, uh, a set-based CRDT, um, and it's actually written directly into the file system and we gossip it that way. So you look at your friends and you replicate in. Yeah. Um, but you can post these revocation lists uh, anywhere, right? Uh, so if you're, uh, we're working on a, a few systems that are you know, within some consortium, they're gonna collaborate uh, and they want to share much faster the revocation lists, uh, they can just share directly with each other. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what sort of performance overhead did this have? So relative to um, a local file system, yeah, there's apps, absolutely overhead, right? Um, you can uh, uh, cache results because it's all hash linked, right? So you can cache results like really, really well. And once you have the data locally, it's actually not so bad. When you're incurring anything on the network, it's really bad, right? Because you're you now have let's call it to be generous, a 200 millisecond round trip, right? Relative to always writing into somebody else's database, it is blazingly fast by about one to two orders of magnitude because we're not making those network requests. So the answer is it's kind of in between, depending on where the data lives for your specific, at that specific time. Yeah. Uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, if people have other questions, my contact information is up there. Thank you very much.